Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I was just talking to our guest today in the uh, green room. Uh, he's an awesome guy. Uh, hopefully, you folks find his uh, content engaging and exciting. Uh, and I'm really excited to have him here today. But before we get started, let's do some housekeeping. So first of all, um, uh, you know our guest today. But uh, if you're watching us live right now on YouTube, uh, there's a little chat right on the side of this video. I see some of you are already uh, putting in questions and talking to each other. and That's great. Uh, if you have questions for our guest today, please put them in there uh, and we'll ask him questions at the end of the show. One of the main questions a lot of people ask us are, is this session webinar being recorded and will it be available on YouTube later? Yes, of course it is. Uh, feel free to ask it, but I've already answered it, so don't ask it. <laughs> but on that note, uh, I'd like to welcome our guest today, uh, Shimon, um, a really smart guy, one of the co-founders of .netos and uh, an async expert uh, that uh, helps the community. So welcome, Shimon. Uh, it's really nice to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Yeah, and uh, the chat is blown up. Uh, people are saying hi to you. Uh, you can say hi, wave to them. Uh, it's really exciting. Hello. So. Hello. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. So today we'll dive into uh, into low level stuff a bit. So I did my best to make it as gentle as possible. So uh, volatile will appear only in the middle of the session. Uh, and we'll try to basically learn uh, what is it all about? Uh, when you should use it and when you should not, probably. And yeah, and I have a few examples. I did my best to make it a bit funny, a bit interesting, and at the same time, educational as usual. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to move over and uh, I'm going to enjoy this just like everybody else is. So, floor is yours. Perfect. So, let's get it started then. Uh, awesome. So this is a gentle introduction to low-level concurrency in .NET. Uh, my name is Shimon Kuletz, and if you want to follow me for anything that I want to make in public, uh, Skuletz is my handle either on the GitHub, Twitter, or anywhere. During this session, uh, I'm wearing two hats, actually. One is the already mentioned the .NETOS hat, which is related to um, Understanding .NET, and this is the initiative that we uh, uh, co-created with Konrad Kokosa and Łukasz Pyzyk. So we we basically try to uh, teach uh, what the .NET is all about, what are some of its intrinsic properties. And uh, we are also uh, focused at least a bit on the performance side of it. So if the things are either scalable or just fast because they are fast, that's what we are interested in. On the other hand, I'm wearing the Nethermind uh, hat, which is the uh, client, Ethereum client, written in .NET. And uh, the, the Ethereum ecosystem with the modern um, advantages of modern math, sometimes call, called moon math, this is a really interesting uh, area to think and to reason about scalability, not only as uh, like adding a few more VMs, but also using um, amazing stuff like zero knowledge proofs and all the crazy math behind it. So these two um, hats are combined on my head. Uh, Probably the uh, the common denominator is the performance and uh, making things fast and scalable. I want to mention that with uh, .netos, uh, we created an async expert online course. So if this talk makes you interested in this specific topic, or if you want to dive deeper into async stuff, uh, concurrency, parallelism, or uh, concurrent data structures, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the async expert. And if you are interested, JetBrains underscore gentle. This is the uh, secret code, so please do not share it anywhere. And this will get you a 10% discount on the uh, price of the course. So again, if you are interested in parallelism, concurrency, tasks, uh, concurrent data structures, this is something that you should take a look at. As with every talk, uh, it's, I mean, 
Some talks are provided by folks who uh, read a book, and I did my best to recall all the experiences that I had with volatile or interlocked. And uh, the first, probably, and the most meaningful one is blowing up Event Store. So, Event Store, this is a uh, a database that was created by Greg Young, uh, and I believe it was the, there was a meeting uh, on JetBrains TV uh, about it. So um, uh, what I did, I created a, a better queues PR. This is a really nice name for a PR, and as usually or as sometimes maybe it happens with volatile, uh, what it did, it uh, blew up even store in production. So. If you want to take a look at that and the uh, uh, link for the slides, and the slides include all the links, I mean, th this is clickable. If you want to follow up the story, just click on the link and you will see whether these cues were uh, better or not. The second uh, experience, and that was a, a long running one, let's say, was a, a journey project that I did. And this is uh, the thing called Ramp Up. It was based on uh, Aaron, which is a messaging framework that you can use in Java and C++. And as I was building ramp up, uh, Aaron.net was announced. So the journey stopped. But still, if you are interested in, again, a bit of low level concurrency, how to put volatile or use interlocked, sorry, I should have used this word. I sh should pause with using this word still the middle of the session. But still, if you are uh, interested in looking at this kind of stuff, ramp up it is. Uh, the third experience, optimizing various projects, not necessarily uh, open source. And the last, which unfortunately quite often happens when you deal with either interlocked or volatile, uh, it was just sobbing and saying it worked under debugger or in a uh, debugging environment. I want to add a word of caution, and this word of caution is delivered by uh, Dmitry uh, Vyukov, who is an Intel black belt, really, really smart person, and he co-created this Atomic Danger article. And he mentions several flavors of danger that programmers enjoy the en intellectual puzzle, or that the implementations are almost always ill-advised, that programmers make mistakes, that the core is hard for others to maintain, especially if you use these low-level primitives, but it should be written by a few experts. And basically that we should not use atomic operations, meaning volatile or interlocked. So Dimitri Vyukov, actually, he is the guy, if you think about concurrency. He also inspired the modern implementation of the concurrent queue in .NET. If you take a look at the implementation, you will see his name is mentioned there. And he publishes 1,024 cores. This is a really awesome blog if you want to dive deeper into this. So it looks like writing code using volatile and interlocked should be left to experts. But nobody said that we can't read it, understand it, and have some fun with it, right? So let's jump into a, an example of a volatile shopping basket, and we will use two simple actors here in this example, uh, a person who wants to add some items to a shopping basket. And we have a person who's responsible for summing it up and basically taking the payment, a cashier. So the scenario is as follows. The person wants to add a carrot to a basket. Then uh, they want to add uh, a potato. Then they want to say that, OK, this basket is ready for a checkout. And then the checkout happens. If we consider that from the perspective of a modern CPU, if that was a single threaded execution, we are just safe. Because I mean, even with all the optimizations, and we can think about ARM or M1 from Apple or any modern Intel or AMD, if that was a single threaded execution, it would be just ordered, or the compiler, the hardware would make it look like it is totally ordered and there would be no uh, like any hazard in regards to things being reordered or executed in different um, ordering. But if, if there was an external observer, the things are not that easy. 
because depending again on your CPU, compiler, uh, framework, because this works not only for .NET, but also, for example, C++ with all the various options that you can pass and optimize the compilation, the execution for the external observer could be totally different. So that could be, for example, a carrot is being added, a potato is being added, and then a basket is marked as ready to go. But also, a carrot is being added, a basket is marked as ready to go, and then a potato is added. So all these different uh, factorial uh, possibilities uh, could, could happen, or if I could say it more precise, could be perceived uh, in such an ordering. After all, at the end, all the properties are matched. This is the, the fact that the carrot is there, that the potato is there, and that the basket is ready for uh, being checked out. So now uh, we could ask that, OK, so if the cashier was run as another thread, what cases um, would make it work? So what cases would be OK from the cashier point of view that uh, he or she can basically work with and successfully perform the checkout operation? And now if we think about it, so probably that would be cases where the basket is checked out only after adding a potato and a carrot in any order. So now if we revisit all the factorials possi factorial possibilities, you would see that this is only the first and the last, because in the first we have a, a carrot being added and then a potato being added and then uh, uh, basket is checked out, and with the last, it goes potato, carrot, and then the basket. So, a person and a cashier, in that case, should work together to make sure that the basket is marked as ready, but only after these two items are in. And to make that happen, we could introduce some pixie dust, some magic, or in our case, we will use a fancy emoji arrow operator that will ensure some ordering for external observers. So what the uh, what that person can do is that they can say that, OK, put a, a carrot there, put a potato. I don't care about this ordering. But then I put this special operator that uh, does the following. If, if uh, the basket is perceived by an external op um, observer as ready, it means that the potato and the carrot will be also visible. And this is, this is basically the only thing that this operator ensures. It, does not, and it, doesn't, it doesn't ensure uh, immediate visibility or any stuff like that. What we do actually is we just put a small ordering here we ensure that if a basket is perceived as ready to be checked out, the previous two operations, their results will be also visible. And this is actually how Volatile works, that it provides this partial ordering and it ensures that the things that are, if things after Volatile are visible, things before should be visible as well. And this is in regards to the external observer, meaning another thread trying to uh, process the data. So in this case, a writer and a reader can use this volatile, meaning this arrow operator, to create a coordination point. So a writer, in this case, the, the, the person who's responsible for putting items um, in the basket, will use either a volatile field or volatile write to put to mark the basket as ready. A reader, in this case, this is the cashier, will use either volatile field or volatile read to read the status of the basket. If the basket will be marked as ready to go, then it means that they will also see the, the, all the things that were put in there, meaning that they will see a carrot and a potato. Effectively, 
if you see a value written with volatile, you will see the writes that happened before this write. And this is the sole premise of volatile that allows you to construct a more higher level stuff. OK, now you could say, OK, this ain't a gentle introduction because you already use the volatile, the forbidden word. So what I can propose you is that we will dive into another example to turn the problem around and see at the volatile from, take a look at the volatile from another perspective. So let's revisit this example with a person who wants to buy something and a cashier who wants, who wants to perform a checkout. And now we will use a volatile conveyor belt. So a person should be able to put an item on the belt. Uh, that person should be also um, uh, should be also able to to make make it sure that the cashier is informed, and the last but not least, the cashier should collect an item once it's there. I mean, sometimes if I do the grocery or I go to the grocery shop, it, it, it's quite often that I will put an item on the belt, and then the cashier will immediately pick it up even if I didn't finish uh, the unloading. So this is basically the case. And this would allow uh, that person and uh, that cashier to work in a producer-consumer fashion, where items are operated one by one, because one could put an item on the belt, and then the other could pick it up in the meantime, where or when the, the person who's putting items adding is adding more items to the belt. So how could this be done? Let's imagine that we have a really short belt. Uh, I mean, there are only two, uh, you can put only two items on it. So this is like a ridiculously small grocery store where you have a belt that can hold either a, a carrot or a potato. I mean, two items. And let's add a count uh, that will represent the number of items that are on the belt. Now we could imagine that the person uh, puts a carrot in there and then sets the counter to one. Okay, we also know that it could result in the same error as before because an external observer, some other, other thread, could read first the um, number one and then try to pick up the carrot, but the carrot wouldn't be there. So how to make sure that one is visible only after the putting happens? Again, we could use this, um, we could use this uh, arrow operator. So first, that person would put a carrot in there. Then they would just make sure that if one is visible, a carrot is visible as well. The second part would be that they would put a potato. And again, they would use this operator to ensure that if two is visible, the potato at the index, sorry, this is index one, not index two, but the count is two, that the potato is also there. And this is everything that is needed for the cashier to operate with these numbers. So if the count is one, they can be sure that they can take a look at the position one minus one meaning zero, and something will be there. The same for the two. So uh, the, the, the most important thing about it is the, that the cashier needs to remember last process count. So if I was a, a cashier, I could remember that, OK, the recent count or the recent position, however we want to name it, is zero. If I observe one, I know that I have one thing to consume. Of course, you could optimize it, and this is what sometimes happens, that, for example, a person who has more things to put on, to put on the belt, they would put multiple things and then just set the number to, let's say, two, three, or five. But again, this number would be put with this arrow operator, and this ordering operator is uh, nothing more than a volatile. Now we know at least somehow how this arrow volatile works. So let's take a look at the concurrent queue 
and let's take a look how volatile is used in one of its um, areas because I mean there are a few volatiles in there but we will take a look at a single one. So at the beginning a short brief uh, through what a concurrent queue is. So from a, a concurrent data structure point of view it's categorized as unbounded MPMC, meaning this is the multi-producer, multi-consumer unbounded queue. Multi-producer and multi-consumer, it means uh, that it, it is a concurrent queue that allows multiple producers, meaning multiple actors, multiple threads, you name it, adding items or enqueuing items at the same time. Multi-consumer, it means that multiple uh, actors can try to dequeue from the queue at the same time. This is this categorization. If if you dive into the uh, world of concurrent data structures, is quite important because if you have a multi, then you need to handle the multi. But if there was a single producer, for example, multi consumers, then you can perform some optimizations. At the same time as the concurrent queue is a generic purpose concurrent queue, it's MPMC. It's worth to add that this is a real queue, so the order is preserved. If you, if you add an item number one and item number two, they will go out on the other end, first item number one, then item number two. It's also worth to mention, and we'll see in a second. Uh, we'll see it in a second in, uh, on a bigger picture that uh, it it is built from um, bounded segments, and this is uh, quite. I mean, this technique you can uh, quite often find it in unbounded data structures because it's it's much easier to create a bounded one. Uh, so uh, no pointers, no nothing like that, good amorti amortization, you can just use an array underneath. And then having bounded data structure, if you link them together, a few bounded segments, you get an unbounded one because you can always allocate one segment more. And this is actually how concurrent queue works underneath. If you like never use that, I mean, the operations are pretty straightforward. So you can enqueue an an item to the queue. You can try the queue, and this is important to mention that this is try the queue, not the queue, because this is not a blocking collection. This is a non-blocking collection. So if there is nothing out there, it will just return false. Of course, we can try peak, so we'll take a look at the last item, but we won't queue it. There is the count, and there is the is empty which nowadays is a, fact check, a fast check. Back in a day, it wasn't that fast for uh, checking whether a queue is empty or not. And this is uh, uh, a graph, uh, or sorry, the graphic that I shameless, shamelessly stolen from Async Expert, but it shows how, uh, how actually concurrent queue works. So we have uh, head and tail that are uh, on the queue level they point to segments, segments point to each other. So we have a linked list in there. And each segment has a head and tail. And then as you can see, there is an array of sequence numbers and values. We'll dive into this implementation a bit deeper uh, in a minute or two, but please do remember that so that each value has a corresponding sequence number. This is really important to, uh, to get it right. So the concurrent key design, it's a wrap. And basically, it's, it's a small wrap for a head and a tail, where head, this is the first segment, tail, this is the last segment. If the queue is empty or almost empty, usually a single segment will be sufficient to handle it. So then head will be equal to tail. And if, again, this is an unbounded data structure. If more uh, items are added to the queue, more segments will be allocated. And then between head and tail, uh, we'll find more segments. Now, how does a, a segment look like? So we already know that it, this is bounded. It, it, is, it has a, a, a link, I mean, a reference to the next segment. And it uses a padded structure uh, to store the head and the tail. Padding, I mean, 
just a, a brief remark about it. This is an operation when you make the uh, a given data structure bigger than it's needed to separate it uh, between um, cache lines. So in that case, uh, padded head and tail will make sure that head and tail uh, are stored in different cache lines because it allows it uh, to be basically faster. Then the slot. So you do recall this array that there was uh, uh, two arrays of sequences and items. And actually, an item and a sequence create a slot. And as we saw here, as we saw here, uh, each segment has an array of slots. So um, yep, it can uh, contain multiple items, but it's always bounded uh, in size. So now this is the try and queue operation, and I removed a lot of code in comments in here. There, there are more operations happening, but again, I just want to show you that the the ordering with volatile right is something that you can think about and reason just by looking at this code. So as you can see, this is pretty similar to the volatile conveyor belt that we were discussing before. So that first, the slot uh, I, uh, it, it has its item set, and then volatile right happens with some number. I mean, we will discuss this number, why, why this is assigned in, in that manner. But you can see the item is written first, and then uh, the sequence number is written. There are a, a few uh, reasons for that. Of course, if that was just an object, uh, that usually is cool because object, a reference to an object is uh, atomic on any CPU architecture, meaning that it's you can just copy it without uh, trashing it in the middle. But if that structure was a bit bigger, then writing to an item uh, could be potentially uh, done in a, let's say, non-atomic uh, manner. So we need to have this um, possibility to mark the specific item as ready. And please do remember that we are just adding plus one to this T. This is something that uh, that is uh, pretty important. Then on trying DQ, what happens is that we do the following. Again, a lot of code was removed here uh, just to keep the, the volatile thing and uh, reason about it. So first, of course, we uh, copy the item from the slot to a variable. Then we assign default item to, to the item, which again, if that's a reference type, we'll just get null. If this is a struct, we'll get an empty uh, thing being written to the item. And you can see that Again, it's sealed by writing the sequence number for the specific slot. And again, this sequence is getting bigger. So if we are an NQR, what we will do, we will read the sequence from the slot. If the sequence is, let's say, right, we will write the item, we'll write the, um, the carrot there. And then we will use volatile to store that sequence plus one. On the DQR side, again, we'll read the sequence, we'll ensure that this is right, and we are ready to DQ. Then we will erase the, the cell of the slot, and then we will use volatile to write, uh, again, a bigger number. And this is, sorry, maybe I'm too excited, but to me, it's pure awesomeness because there is one thing that we should notice. The sequence is always increasing. There is no like uh, switch between true or false that item is there or not, because that could be re that could result in a like stale ordering or reading in a pr uh, data in a wrong manner. Because if you read, for example, false and you observed false before, you wouldn't be able to tell what was it. Is it the false from like one? cycle one cpu cycle ago or is it the false that i'm reading right now with the always increasing number you are you you will never see the same value twice and you can reason and check according to the invariance that i i mean i must admit i are pretty complex for the concurrent queue but you can always observe and reason on this foundation that this is an always increasing number and 
either you are enqueuing or dequeuing from a concurrent queue, the sequence after each operation for the specific slot will always be increased. So we don't we won't run into the situation when you observe three for the second time and then you don't know what to do about it, whether this is the NQR or DQR status. They are well defined and always increasing. And this is what what's probably is quite important to remember about volatile that we want to uh, usually with these concurrent data structures, they will follow this, that there will be something, um, some some count, counter or sequence that will be increased so that you can reason on top of that. So now we could add uh, a few sequences. That That is the one that we already uh, answered. So why sequences are always increasing? So again, if we observe sequences one, two, three, two, four, five, then we wouldn't be able to tell which two was it. With always increasing sequences and some math calculations, whether or not the sequence is already set to the value it should be, we can reason whether the value is there or whether, for example, it was already dequeued. Another question related to volatile, and this is happens like, uh, this is the usual answer for any volatile question that it, it it, set, it makes the value non-cached or something like that. And actually, the best thing, at least the, the best mental model that I have uh, that is related to that, is that volatile uh, has uh, happened before semantics. So basically, if you write with volatile and you read with volatile, so if you read this value, you can be sure that all the writes that were preceding it will be also visible for, for the thread that is executing your code. And another question, so if volatile does not guarantee that the most fresh non-cached value is read, does it mean that retries are required to get the, the, the recent value? And unfortunately, yes. And usually, if you take a look at any, let's say, uh, more fancy, um, so not log-based data structure, you will see that usually they use volatile and there will be a fast path where there is just a single check and we are okay, so the, the value is as we want it to be and we can proceed. Or later, it can be followed by a slow path. Usually it's a while loop that basically will check the value multiple times until it is read uh, in the form that it should be. So summing up, volatile does not trash any caches, nothing like that. It just ensures uh, happen before semantics, that all the writes that happen before uh, 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 storing the value that you are reading currently are also visible to you. The next part is about interlocked football. I'm not sure if you ever played that. Uh, I did not because I made up this game, but still, this is a pretty awesome game. So the score can be modified by any arbiter at any time. And I mean like any arbiter at any time, there are like 20 or 50 on the field. This is ridiculous. But anyway, there is one ball uh, that is in a possession of one of two teams. So no outs, nothing like that. It's like a ridiculously sticky ball. It's always either us or them owning it. And the last rule is that the exchanges after match, I mean, the t-shirt exchanges are instant, uh, but, the play, but the player uh, should know uh, what is being exchanged. So they just grab a t-shirt that they want to exchange with. So they go to the trainer, give me a t-shirt, then they select a, a victim and they say, yeah, we need to exchange. But this exchange is atomic, and we want to make sure that the exchange happens happens uh, with the T-shirt that they observed. I know this sounds uh, like a ridiculous game, but believe me, it will make sense in a second. So let's take a look at the uh, scoring with an arbiter. So usually, that, that the algorithm would be that an uh, arbiter goes to the scoreboard, make sure that uh, they are the only one in charge of it. They would read the value 
add one and store the value. If we wanted to write it with a, a, a football C sharp or whatever the name of that language would be, uh, that arbiter would log the scoreboard and just increment the value by one. But this arbiter wants to do it atomically. So they want to just say, OK, increase the value and deal with all the locking, uh, or maybe don't deal with all the locking, just incre increase it in an atomic way. And we could ask, is there a way to make that happen? And fortunately for us, yes, there is. So interlock class provides you with a few methods that, that you can use to interact with, uh, atomically with any specific uh, uh, value location. So you can, of course, add a value, which is just you ref something and you uh, add a value to it. There is also the increment, which is basically add uh, ref one. There is also the decrement, which is basically add ref minus one. And the important fact is that this method returns the value. So if you increment something, you will get the number that you incremented to. So that arbiter can be happy because they know the score. They know to which number they incremented it. And yeah, so it lo lo looks like that. Basically interlocked increment ref scoreboard, and then we get the current score. The other rule that we need to handle is the uh, one ball, two teams. So let's assume that we have two teams, bats and rockets, and one ball, ball uh, that is owned only by, by one of them. And I mean, exchanges should be atomic, and there is no moment where the ball is not owned or that is owned by two teams. Again, if we wanted to handle it somehow, uh, uh, we could just lock the ball and then set the owner. Again, lock would protect two actors on working on the same resource with the same resource. And it would be either bats or rockets that can lock it and then assign the uh, owner of the ball. But we could also ask, because this is an interlocked football, whether there is a way of atomically exchange it, uh, that the, the ball is exchanged between the teams in an atomic way. And yes, there is. Uh, interlock exchange is a method that exchange uh, under the specific location basically puts the value in there and returns the previous one. So again, you can know what was in there before you put your value in it. So again, in our case, if bats wanted to just uh, claim the ball, they could use the ball as the uh, location, and they would say, OK, we are the owner uh, of the ball right now. The last thing uh, about the interlock football uh, is the exchange for uh, between two players. So again, the scenario is as, uh, the following. A player wants to exchange the t-shirt. They go to, the, to their trainer. Uh, they say, OK, give me a one free T-shirt. They take this T-shirt and they go to another player and they say, I want to exchange this with you. With, I want this T-shirt in exchange. And again, that could be done with a uh, lock or maybe potentially that we would lock this other player T-shirt and we would try to exchange it or do something like that. I don't know. This is like really, really weird because it reminds me all these double locking stuff or multiple locks. Ah, let's not do it this way. We want to do it atomically and conditionally because we want to make sure that we are making the exchange only if we are exchanging for the T-shirt that we observed before. And to make that happen, uh, we would use compare exchange. This is the, the most mouthful the longest uh, signature of all the interlocked methods, I believe. And again, it follows the same mantra. So there is the location that you want to write to. You add the value, but the third parameter is the value that you want to compare with. And if the location is equal to the value that you compare with, the switch will happen. If the value is, sorry, if the value under the location 
is different from the comparant that we are passing, the switch won't happen. It's important that this value, uh, sorry, this method returns the previous value that was um, under location in any case. Why, why is that value needed, we, you could ask. So let's take a look at that, like a terrible interlocked football C-sharp code that we would write to make this switch happen. So first, we would volatilely read the, the other uh, T-shirt, and we would store it in scene uh, variable. Then we would decide whether we are interested in that T-shirt. Is that the T-shirt okay to exchange for, or maybe not? And then what we would do, and this is pretty uh, important, we would use this scene that we just read, and put that as a comparant in the compare exchange. Now, the follow-up if is um, works as follows: if the value that was returned from compare exchange, so the value that was underneath, actually under the other, is seen is something that we uh, saw before, then exchange happened because it fulfilled this equality condition. If it is something different, then the, ex then the exchange did not happen, we can sob, or if you are a concurrency freak or a folk that wants to write it uh, in a really performant way, you will probably loop again and try to read the value and try to swap it again after you decide that this is the t-shirt that you want to switch with. And just to make it a bit more concrete than just an interlocked football, imaginary interlocked football, we can take a look at the how concurrent stack works actually. So concurrent stack, uh, again, this is a, just a stack, a usual stack with push and pop operations. It's log free, so it doesn't have any logs in it, and it can be used concurrently. So if you have multiple actors that add on top of it and remove from it, this is perfectly fine. This is just like a regular stack, nothing fancy beside some uh, concurrent magic inside of it. So a uh, concurrent stack has a node. This node, as usual with, uh, with stack, it has pointer to the next and it has its value. And now let's take a look how the uh, push operation for this stack happens. Uh, with number one, you can see that there is the volatile head. Again, if a field is volatile, it will mean uh, that uh, any write or any read to this head will be marked as volatile. So if you read from this field, it will be volatile read. If you write to this field, it will be volatile write. So now let's take a look what happens. We, we allocate a new node, and why we need to allocate will be covered in a second. And then we set this next uh, next of this node to the head that we just read. So this, this assignment basically means that we are reading head with volatile, we store it in the next, and then we go to the section number three. In the section number three, you can see that we are using the compare exchange. And the compare exchange, we can take a look at the last parameter of it, which is next. And this n next is actually the head that we just read. So it it, it works as following: we, we have this, we create a new node, we point to the head that, that we observed, and then we say that we try to switch with the head if the head is the head that we observed. If if that's the head that we observed, the switch will uh, will be made, and this is the the happy path. If there is uh, if these values are not equal, it means that either either someone um, interrupted us with another push or another pop and head uh, was changed in the background. If, and if that happens, there is this push core method, which uh, is a bit slower because as usual with either volatile or interlocked, if you have this, let's say, a fancy concurrency data structure, there will be some loop that will handle the slow path um, of this algorithm. The pop works in a pretty similar way. So in section in line number one, 
we can see that we read the head and store it in age. Again, I abbreviated the uh, variables a bit. So if you take a look at the source of the .NET, they, they, will, they will be longer. I just did it for the readability purposes. So in line number one, we read the head with volatile because head is volatile. Then we try to, we extract from it next in line number two. And then again, with in the section number three, we try to swap the head to the next if the head did not change. And we do it in a loop because if that failed, we should, we should try again. So now the question could be, okay, you said performance, all low level stuff, but why on earth uh, concurrent, stat, concurrent stack, why does it allocate new nodes? And why can't we just reuse them as in a concurrent queue? And it is done to overcome ABA problem. This is like a problem where you observe A multiple times. Again, something that I mentioned when, when doing the, the volatile or mentioning always increasing sequences. Uh, but this A means something else. So it's either allocation using tagged pointers or making the data structure really complex. Um, so basically in .NET, we have the allocation for, for each push that happens. Uh, we, we could ask further because there is the buffers.memory pool. It was built back in a day for Kestrel and it doesn't use concurrent stack, but rather a concurrent queue for the block management. So this pool actually uh, is using four uh, kilobytes uh, blocks and it uses the concurrent queue for the pool management. So yeah, we don't need no allocations and as concurrent queue, uh, it does not allocate. When it, when it's bounded, it does not allocate. It, it will just go through uh, the segments all over again. We should be just fine. And the last example, sorry, but I need to mention something like really low level, terribly low level, so safe handle. Uh, I'm not sure if you work with that. I have some gray hair. Uh, uh, due to uh, my involvement with uh, with some of the handle management. Uh, but the uh, safe handle is basically a basic class for uh, wrapping and manage resources, libraries, whatever. Uh, this is the, the safe handle that will be used. Uh, it's also a source of nightmares for handle recycling security attacks, a really interesting attacks, but they are addressed uh, in it. And again, it's an interesting study of cooperation of volatile and interlocked. And just a brief through how safe handle looks like, you will see that, I mean, as usual with this low level concurrency stuff, there are some volatile fields and we won't be discussing how safe handle works, but I want to uh, ask you for putting your, I mean, focusing on the state field, which as you can see, this is a volatile integer field. And this is also something that sometimes is used when you work with this low level stuff. So what is done for the state field is actually there is a smart encoding that uses bits and some bit binary operations, bit shifting to uh, store multiple uh, variables in one volatile field, because if you have it in one integer, then you can atomically exchange it. So we have ref count, which takes, uh, let me count it, 30 bits. We have uh, D, which is um, one means dispose, and zero, which means that the underlying handle uh, is, I, I mean, either has been released or will be shortly. And if we take a look at one of the, like the most, um, uh, nicely named methods, <laughs> dangerous at ref. You can see that again, this is a really similar story to, to everything that we observed with the interlock compare exchange. So there is a loop, of course. And first, in the section number one, you can see that we read the state to the old variable. Then we check whether it was closed or not. Uh, we add uh, it, in line number three, we change the state a little bit. 
let's not dive into like the the semantics behind it but then in uh, in section number four we try to swap it and again we use compare exchange and we compare with the old uh whether the 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 value underlying is old if not we will spin again and again sorry for repeating that but this is the, the usual mantra of this low level concurrency stuff that you try something and then if you were not successful because something some, somebody else acted or interacted with your data structure you will spin again or return false for example if you failed to do so so yeah the volatile field is uh used to try to read value most recent we use interlock compare exchange to try to swap if nothing changed underneath and we retry it in a uh we retry it in a tight loop uh on failure so yeah like key takes key take aways from from this session uh uh, Dmitry Vyukov, the person who inspired uh, and is responsible for the concurrent queue and a lot of other stuff, says to default to using existing structure and locks. But as I mentioned, uh, reading and understanding is not prohibited. Volatile uh, keyword and volatile read and volatile write has nothing to do with the CPU caches. Um, I mean, CPU caches will act accordingly, but the, the understanding is that this is just about happened before semantics and partial ordering of your uh, operations for external uh, actors. So again, this is just if you put this arrow and you read a value with uh, that was re you read with a volatile a value that was written with volatile you can be sure that all the writes that happened before will be visible to you. And the last but not least, interlocked provides atomic operations that are executed as a whole. If I may add one low level stuff, because uh, it, it should have been a gentle introduction, but I need to add that. Actually, uh, under uh, interlocked, there will be a, a, a small lock taken on a cache line and that's why this interlock will be performed atomically because on your cpu your cache line will be locked i mean a cache line including your the, the value that you're working with the location will be locked will be either swapped incremented or compare exchange and then returned to you if you are looking for some additional uh, materials uh, three top books a primer on memory consistency and cache coherence Oh gosh, this sounds terrible. But first, uh, when I was reading that, the book is was uh, accessible for free and was uh, um, accessible on the publisher page. So, uh, so really, really, I encourage to do it, even if you don't have that much experience with, with low level stuff. This is something that strongly and clearly put a line between uh, memory model and cache coherence stuff, and it, it, it's really written in depth, but in a really nice and understandable language. Second book, what every programmer should know about memory. This book has over like 15 years probably, but it's still, uh, I mean, pure gold. I, if you haven't read that, and if you don't know about this low level, like cache lines, etc., this is the stuff. And the last but not least, written by Joe Duffy, so the person responsible for Midori and now for Pulumi, and also the person who's at least partially responsible for spans, which were called slices back then, and tasks, and I mean, a lot of stuff, concurrent programming on Windows. It covers uh, probably everything that I covered during this talk, and it's also an amazing um, stuff to, to read. Again, I will just remind you that uh, Async Expert with JetBrains Gentle, underscore Gentle, if you want to chime in and participate in Async Expert. And that would be it. So that was hopefully, hopefully, a gentle introduction to low-level concurrency in .NET. And now we have some time for questions and answers. Yeah, uh, I think I want to put carrots and potatoes on my grocery list, by the way, so. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the first questions actually asked was early on, but I think you kind of covered it in one of your last uh, slides, which is 
does C Sharp have an analog of Java's happens before promise slash problems, right? Like, I guess the person was asking, like, what's the analogous happens before? But I think you mentioned in your last slide, it was uh, the keyword volatile, right? Uh, yes, I mean, also the, the, the language itself and the memory model of the language. Uh, I need to, I try to be precise, but at the same time, I think I might be uh, mixing some words. But anyway, <laughs> there is a memory model on, on your CPU. So, for example, Intel will, will provide the total store ordering or the language can provide you with some. But actually, volatile is the, the, the semantic keyword. Uh, mm -hmm. that you can use to introduce this happen before semantics and enforce it uh, in your source code. Regarding Java, uh, I'm pretty, I mean, maybe pretty decently familiar with the beauty of the unsafe class in there. Mm -hmm. And it has so much more methods than interlocked and volatile, but still this happened before semantics with either volatile keyword or volatile dot read and write can be ensured. Okay, so you're saying Java is better than C Sharp. No, I'm just joking. Nope, 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 <laughs> nope. <laughs> Let's not go into this direction. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the thing I, I noticed during it is like the interlock class is really powerful. Uh, one of our viewers, Dimitri, was asking, um, when do you need atomicity compared to single lock code construction? I think they were basically asking like, what's the difference between using the interlock class versus the lock keyword in C Sharp? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is there an advantage to one over the other in any particular scenario? Yeah, I mean, usually my answer would be to, uh, to follow just Dimitri uh, uh, words that you should prefer to, to use lock uh, in, in any case. And if you find that this is actually the bottleneck, uh, there are several ways to address that. One, of course, is that if that's a, either a number or some, let's say a single object that you want to list, you can use interlocked, of course. But also sometimes you may uh, think on a bit higher level. And for example, if you have multiple actors and I use actors not in an, like the actor system, uh, mm -hmm. meaning but like any you know any threads anything like uh, that is run uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, if you have multiple actors, maybe it should, and you want to, for example, count something. Sometimes it might be easier if each count if actor holds their own counter and then report that counter somewhere else. So mm -hmm. you you move just the you just move the coordination problem from a single point. And if that is okay, you just move it to a sing every single actor. And for example, merging that can happen every other minute or something like that. And then even a single lock will be sufficient because the coordination won't, won't hurt that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess at that point you have to figure out what your consensus though, like re resolution consensus is, right? Like if for um, some reason both counts aren't the same, what do you do in that case, right? Uh, yeah, but for example, if you are counting, uh, so let me give you an example. You are counting uh, some occurrences. So if one actor uh, counted two and the other counted three, then you can easily converge them by summing them up. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes. Uh, sense. But then we are going into the semantics behind the operation that want you want to interact with or that you want to perform. So. Sorry, I need that. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the answer. We should have yeah. an it depends uh, webinar where it's just an hour of people saying it depends. Um, I can know, chime in definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the amazing things I learned during this webinar was uh, I didn't really know concurrent queues don't allocate if they're bounded. Like that was kind of an amazing piece of knowledge. So uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, the, the thing I noticed too, and this is my personal question, uh, with the slow path, the looping and kind of comparing values, um, like, is there ever a scenario where like throughput could get into a situation where you essentially get into an infinite loop? Or is that just like such a far out problem that it likely would never occur? I mean, we, we can consider, so let's consider, for example, the 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 memory pool that was originated or was born from Kestrel. So mm -hmm. 
in that case, borrowing a single block, I would I I could bet that this is the 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 really small part of time that uh, that that you perform that action and you have much more compute heavy stuff like decoding and uh, doing all the other things. So in that case, the probability of, of having, a, um, let's say a hot uh, data structure that you frequently interact with so that you run into this, uh, the slow path all the time is really, really unlikely. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. and. If you make it that, I mean, if you make it fast just by using these data structures, it's getting even lower. Mm -hmm. So there is a fine, fine line. It does the, uh, the <laughs> or fine line. I believe this is the the the, the saying uh, uh, be between like um, uh, thinking about this uh, problem and actually having it. Because usually mm -hmm. this is like using this heavily optimized fast paths. So that they are not, uh, you won't hit this the slow path that often. Okay. Yeah. So possible, not likely, probable in any real world scenario. Is would that be fair to yeah, say? Yeah. 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 Unless un unless you are trying to hammer concurrent queue with two threads, but again, the, the, this usually won't happen because this will be like, okay, we have two thre threads. So beside hammering concurrent queue. They will also do this other thing, which will greatly reduce the possibility of uh, having this uh, terribly hot path or terribly cold path in <laughs> concurrent queue. OK. Um, yeah, one last question um, from uh, Alessandro. Uh, I think, what about the other synchronization structures? I guess he's talking specifically about keywords like monitor, mutex. Um, do you find yourself using those a lot? Are those recommended? Um, oh, your, I mean, uh, that should be your default, I would say, because first writing the uh, uh, monitor uh, or log, which is actually the same, mm -hmm. uh, this is pretty straightforward, well understood. And if you, if you have a piece of code that you need to synchronize, uh, I would say that use just use the log. And only if you find yourself in a situation that actually this is the bottleneck that all everything is, I mean, the performance is so terrible due to this log statement. Still, you have some opportunities to uh, to work your way through it. So first, maybe you are doing too much in the log because sometimes this is the case that the log is too fine grained and you can mm -hmm. just think about that maybe some work can be done before claiming the log, sorry, uh, uh, taking a, a lock and then just make the the critical section a bit shorter uh, and then still you have the uh, opportunity that maybe you can just as i described before but maybe this falls into the first category but i just want to reiterate that some of these things can be done potentially can be done locally so like the counters that you count locally but then you sum up only from time to time mm -hmm. to this locked uh, piece of code if if you want to use interlocked and uh, volatile, I would say that you are into a zone where, okay, you are like, uh, there's also one more block called concurrency freaks, which I strongly uh, encourage to take a look at, that you are this concurrently, concurrent uh, freak that you want to just squeeze out the, like the latest, latest bits of performance. But usually this is not the case and regular synchronization primitives are the way to go. But as you can see, Underlying, I mean, if you dig deep enough, concurrent queue, yes, it will use it. Uh, concurrent stack, yes, it will use it. Uh, safe handle, yes, for this dangerous operation. Uh, but this is the 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 like the .NET layer, right? And if you build on top of that, uh, usually log is 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 uh, probably the the best. Uh, tool to, to be used. Mm -hmm. I would add too, if you find yourself in that situation, folks should probably just contact you or get your course and like really understand what they're getting into, right? Like that's 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 uh that's dangerous territory probably. Like yeah. So um yeah I think that's really it for all the questions. Um thanks everybody for kind of showing up. Uh let's uh Shimon do you want to say one last thing uh before I kind of wrap up? Uh, 
I strongly encourage to read all the books that I mentioned. They are really awesome. And uh, on a less serious note, thank you for having me here today. It was a pure pleasure. And I hope everyone learned uh, at least a bit or two uh, right. about Volatile and Interlocked. Yeah, I definitely did. So thank you uh, for showing up. So um, let's uh, do our wind down. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our guest today. Uh, I learned a lot. Hopefully you learned a lot too. Uh, if you want to see more about uh, our .NET content here at JetBrains, uh, please visit uh, our links here on uh you know, the slide. Uh, we write regularly at blog.jetbrains.com forward slash .net. Be sure to follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you like this video and you want to see more uh, guest speakers like uh, Shimon, uh, who did a great job today, by the way, uh, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, uh, and you'll get the latest video content from JetBrains. Um, be sure to follow uh, our guest today on Twitter at Skuletz uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, and also his uh, .netos uh, account at .netos org. Um, and that's it really for today. Again, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.